Hello everyone, I'm uh, Kate uh, Kuzmina and today I will share with you how to, thank you, how to build a data application and uh, a little bit about growth mindset. So we will continue uh, data talks. Um, a bit about myself. I'm a senior consultant uh, on the cloud and uh, data team at Xperis. I've been working for five years in uh, the data field and before I spent sev uh, seven years researching neuropsychology of uh, language processing in humans. And uh, the common line through my whole career was basically that I love data and I love extracting value and knowledge from data in different ways. So let's dive into the uh, uh, project that inspired this session. Uh, we had a project with the Climate Research Institute, Cicero, uh, where they built an application that allows customers, like for example municipalities, to um, create a CO2 emission scenarios based on uh, potential mitigation uh, um, policies or scenarios. So for example, if there is a new policy that politicians introduce that reduces CO2, they want to see how it, ca uh, they show how it influences CO2, CO2 emissions. And the solution for, uh, for that was uh, basically an Excel file, a massive Excel file uh, with, uh, uh, I counted, 90 tabs, uh, a lot of data, a lot of plots and a lot of uh, calculations. Uh, and they sent this file uh, manually to each customer. Um, well, uh, even if this Excel file is perfect and fantastically structured, it's still probably not the, uh, not the most user-friendly solution because it's maybe a bit too much to expect from people to interact with an Excel file. And also it's uh, very time consuming for researchers to send it manually. So instead they should actually, they not should, they want to do research. So we, uh, together with Cicero, we uh, built um, a new solution where that was a cloud-hosted web application where customers can log in and they can see the data uh, in nice uh, dashboards, interactive dashboards. So basically customers are self-served and that's great. So um, let me just show you how this app looks. Uh, I'm running it locally now. So we can see that there are several pages, so we can just jump between them. And we can see that they have uh, plots. Uh, we have uh, some toggles um, that we can interact with. We can choose uh, specific uh, lines if we want. Um, so there is a lot. Um, and we can look at separate sectors. Um, we can also now understand that uh, I did some good stuff with accessibility because you can also take a look at the table uh, and you can also interact with the table a little bit um, and there is like other page that shows you other graphs that are also interactive and nice and again the same structure tables graphs and then you have filters in the sidebar and you can just uh, do different things uh, and then filters will be applied to all graphs on the page and there are many different uh, yeah there are many different variables so now you probably understand why the excel file was so massive because there were data for each aggregation for each variable so it's many many combinations so what is cool about this that we that we separate actually visualization we separate user experience from the data um, nice, and now let's just dive into how to build uh, such an app. So uh, there are three main steps. Uh, the first one is just to build it locally uh, using Python and Streamlit. The second one is to containerize it with Docker, and then we host it in uh, AWS using different AWS services. And we will go through each uh, step. So I think many of you know what Streamlit is, but uh, I will still introduce it. It's a very nice tool. I absolutely love it. Uh, it's an open source uh, framework in Python that allows you to very, very quickly, very simply build interactive, nice data web applications. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, it combines front-end and back-end in one file. Uh, 
and you don't need anything between front end and back end. So, for example, you can see the project structure of, of the app. Um, there are two of the most important things. It's uh, main.py and the folder views. So main.py defines the order of pages in the app that we saw, and in the views, each file corresponds to a specific page that we also saw in the application. Everything is in Python, and uh, if you want to make your project a bit better, of course, you can have as many as you want Python files where you put uh, helper functions, and you can just import whatever functions you want into your Streamlit um, files, like util.py or something. You can also have a uh, configuration toml file where you can define colors or formats or some kind of appearance things for your um, application. So if you have a project with a structure, Streamlit will understand how to render your application. Super simple. Um, basically, you install it as a normal Python package, and then it has very many front-end components that you can use. You basically saw them already, like tabs, warnings, uh, everything. Uh, and you don't need to be a software engineer to basically <laughs> build, um, uh, yeah, build uh, an application. So you just use STLIs, <laughs> and that's it. Um, and to run the app, it's again, you just run Streamlit run uh, main.py, the name of your uh, initial uh, file, and Streamlit opens in your browser automatically. Um, and also, it's good to know that uh, when you make changes in the file, they're immediately shown in your local uh, application. So it's very easy to debug, and it's very easy to develop very fast. Uh, you, oh, I actually didn't, I think I didn't show it. So you can also, we also edit uh, login. So you can, for example, we can log out, and then we can log in, so we can put our username, and password and login. Um, this is a very powerful feature that is actually super easy to implement. Um, we can use the AWS service called Cognito uh, that is responsible for user authentication, and we can use Python package that integrates Cognito with Streamlit, Streamlit Cognito Auth. Uh, so you can just go to AWS, to Cognito service, you create so-called user pool. Um, it's just where you define users who ha can have access to the application. And then you get three environmental variables. You will just see them. And then you just fetch these variables, put it in your environmental file, and um, fill, uh, fill this class with these uh, variables. And that's basically it. So that's all code you need to have nice uh, user authentication uh, element. And then if you want to add a new user, you just go to this uh, pool in AWS, you add an email of a new user, and they get an email notification that in temporary password automatically. And then they're pushed to change the password once they entered uh, for the first time. So super powerful feature, super easy to implement. Um, and so once we are satisfied with our local uh, uh, application, we can containerize it with Docker. Uh, again, quite simple. We just create Docker file within our project with a typical Docker structure. And we also add requirements file where we put all Python packages that are needed to run this application. That's it. So now we can build our image of, the, of our application. And now we can continue to um, uh, the cloud. So we have a nice app running locally. We want it to run in the internet, so everyone has access to it. Um, so first step, uh, and it's again, it's quite a simple process. Uh, the first step is to push our image to the service called Elastic Container Registry. Um, it's a service in AWS. You just go there, and you will even find all the commands that you need to run in your terminal to push the image. So they will be pre-filled. Now you see like placeholders, but they will be pre-filled. So you just uh, go into AWS, you build your image, you tag your image, and you push your image. And then you would see it um, here. So you can check timestamp, that is the image that was pushed just recently, and the image would have a special uh, URI. Cool, so we have our image in AWS, and now, now we need to launch our app. So we, we want it to, to run. And there are uh, four kind of main components that you need to configure. Uh, again, uh, with ClickOps, it's uh, very simple. 
So uh, almost everything is happening within the service called Elastic Container Service. So you just find it in AWS. And the first thing is to create a cluster. A uh, cluster provides infrastructure to run and scale our app. And um, since uh, I am not an um, infra person, uh, I decided that I don't want to deal with infrastructure. I just want everything to happen automatically. And this is why in the infrastructure section, I am choosing serverless option. And uh, uh, the service is called Fargate. So it allows you to run a containerized application without uh, dealing with infrastructure at all. So everything happens automatically on the infrastructure side. Uh, that's basically it. After that, we need to create a task definition. Uh, it's basically a recipe on how to run our container and what to actually run, what container and what image. Again, uh, not many things you will need to kind of choose. Uh, first, we choose, uh, again, serverless infrastructure. And then we uh, need to define operation system and architecture. And here, you need to make sure that architecture you choose actually corresponds to what you used when you built the image locally. And if, you, if something doesn't work, that's actually often the problem, that wrong architecture is chosen. Uh, and then you just uh, define specific resources that you need for your app, CPU and memory. And then you also define container that you use. And this is where you put this URI from the image that you pushed to the uh, registry. That's basically it. We are done. And then there is a, a third component. You need to create a load balancer that distributes incoming traffic to your application. And uh, for this part, there are basically three components that you need to set up. It's security groups, listeners, and target groups. So security groups, they serve as a like guard and protector for our application. This is where you can uh, define what kind of IPs can access your application or range of IPs. You can uh, define what type of data can be exchanged between your application and users, uh, and what ports can be accessible to uh, specific users or specific ranges of IPs. Uh, and then, Listeners, so this is where we define uh, what protocol we use for the data exchange. And at this moment, we can choose only HTTP. Uh, and it's not uh, encrypted, it's not secure, but we will make it secure later. So we just need one more step to make it secure. At this point, it's OK. Uh, and then uh, the target group is basically a set of resources that your load balancer puts, uh, like transfers traffic to. In our case, it would be a uh, task running our application. And again, you will have like all these fields where you can just click and choose. And um, yeah. And then the last part is to create a uh, service. Uh, so service runs and maintains a specific number of copies of your application. So it makes sure that uh, your, um, so your, your, your app runs without any problems, and if uh, any tasks fails, failed, it will, um, uh, it will restart them. Um, so again, here we need to choose the infrastructure, and we chose serverless, um, and we choose number of tasks, number of copies. In this case, it was just one. It means that if our task fails, it will be automatically repaired. So we don't need to worry about it. Um, and also, our application is actually there are not so many users. So we don't need so much to, to, put, to put here. And also, we uh, set up uh, networking, or com we put what we already set up before here. So security groups and um, the application load balancer that we made at the previous step. So at this point, we are basically good to go. And we will get this link uh, in the load balancer that basically anyone, an anyone in the world can access our application following this link, if we share this link, of course. Uh, so you can see that it's HTTP that is not perfect. And the domain, well, domain, the, the link doesn't look very nice. So it would be better to have a nice domain name. Uh, and actually, you can get it from uh, um, service called root 53. So um, I just checked yesterday katekuzmina.com and uh, this domain name is available and I can get it for 14 uh, American dollars per year. Um, so let's say I decided to go for it. Uh, 
uh, and you can choose other domain name, you will get a notification on your email that this is your domain name. Great, uh, you, you got it. And then you need to connect your application to this um, domain name. Uh, and you can do it again in root 53 uh, by creating a so-called DNS record to link uh, your dom new domain name with the, in our case, load balancer. Uh, cool. And the last step is uh, we don't like HTTP. We want uh, a secured protocol. So we want it to be HTTPS. And again, uh, super simple. You can get uh, a certificate SSL certificate from uh, the service called uh, Certificate Manager. So you just go there and you just get it. You request it, you get it. Um, and uh, then you need to add it to root 53. And also you need to change your listener in the load balancer that we set up a little bit. Uh, because now it should listen to encrypted HTTPS traffic and everything that goes to HTTP should be redirected to HTTPS. So these are the, the changes that we need to make. And yeah, that's basically all you need to do to have um, an application running uh, and available for everyone. So for example, this is our production application. So you can see that we bought this domain for this project um, and uh, we have this HTTPS um, protocol and uh, yeah. Um, so we can share it with uh, clients, uh, customers, and they can log in and see their data in a secure way. Um, cool, so that's actually it about uh, the application and how to make it. Uh, but what about the growth mindset? Well, uh, it's a belief that our abilities are never fixed and we can always grow and learn. And uh, it makes perfect sense because uh, brain changes during our whole life. A neuroplasticity is a thing. So yeah, I don't think anyone can argue against this. Uh, and uh, it's good to keep in mind. And I think in this project, there are several examples of growth mindset uh, in action. The first is I'm a data person, but um, data people can also do cloud. They can do infrastructure if they want. Uh, and yeah, I think whoever we are, it doesn't, we, we shouldn't be fixated in it. We should expand our comfort zone and just enjoy it uh, because our brain allows us to do it. And second thing, it's really cool to see that research institutes cooperate with IT industry and uh, we get uh, great results. So researchers can actually do what they want and need to do, real research. And also for the future of this project, of course, uh, uh, to exercise growth mindset, uh, it would be great to switch from the click ops journey that I just showed to you to infrastructure as a code journey. Yeah, thank you very much. That's it for me.